The race is on, and Max Verstappen kicked off 2023 as he ended last year with victory, controlling the Bahrain Grand Prix from start to finish to lead a Red Bull 1-2. But Fernando Alonso provided the drama with a charge to third place on his Aston Martin bow. So can anyone stop Red Bull, and how long will it take Ferrari and Mercedes to get on terms with it? I'm Ed Straw, and joining us to answer those questions and many more are Scott Mitchell Malm and Mark Hughes. Well, Scott, how's the first weekend been for you? We've just got back to our hotel in Manama, long day, but the season's up and running. Yeah, it is. It's good to get things going. Um, I feel like a lot of people, us included, perhaps feared the worst but coming into this weekend. It's been quite an interesting event. I think um, quite big swings, session to session. Gradually, the trend emerged. I don't think the... I think at the very front, the race played out sort of largely as I expected pre-weekend. But if you'd asked me to guess what the situation would be after any given session, Friday, Saturday, I wouldn't have known. And there was an, there, there was a reasonable amount going on behind the, well, I was about to say lead fight. There was no fight. Uh, look, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to pretend that it was a, a stunning season opener. And it's certainly daunting to see the ease with which Verstappen was able to win this race. But, I've still got a little bit of new season optimism. I see a lot of other little subplots going on that are quite fun. I haven't given up total hope of having some individual fights for wins as the season goes on. So I'm, uh, I'm still. I think I'm still basking in the the glow and glory of a new season beginning. You don't necessarily look like someone who's basking in the glow and glory right now. I don't. I I never look like that. To be fair, so I don't think it's fair to blame the slightly dull Bahrain Grand Prix uh, for that one. <laughs> well, it is quite late here, well after midnight, but uh, that's to be expected. And Mark Hughes, how's it been for you? Um, yes, it's been uh, interesting, in um, but n- it, not in the way that uh, we might have hoped for. In that, uh, yeah. The- Fine edge of competition wasn't really there, was it? But uh, yeah, man. It's, it's, there's always things to pick out, and there's, there's always uh, intrigue, and there was plenty of that. I think so. Yeah, I think it was okay. Every season has its own storylines. There's no lack of them, and even if it looks a bit straightforward now, I'm sure there'll be some complications. Well, for the first race of the season, what else can we do but crack open the traditional opening question? how the race was won. Mark, you always take that one on. So how was it won? And maybe give us a bit of an idea of why Red Bull was so supreme. Yeah, this one was really just very straightforward. It was won on downfalls, balance and tyre dig and they, how, they, how they all sort of coordinate together. And the Red Bull is just supreme in how it has a nice spread of, down, just like last year's car, it has a nice spread of downforce throughout the the speed range, um, which in turn means that there's looks after its tires and means that there's less compromise needed at Bahrain, which is um, extreme in how it demands one thing of qualifying and something else completely in the race. Um, it, it, it allowed Red Bull to resolve that conflict better than any other car, w- way better. And even though uh, Verstappen was saying he still wasn't totally happy with the balance as he set a fairly comfortable pole. It was a much better balance and a much better compromise in terms of how it looked after its rear tyres on race day. So, um, yeah, the, 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 the end result was completely dominated by the respective tyre deck of the Red Bull, the Aston Martin, the Ferrari and the Mercedes in, in that order. The great thing is there, you said it was one on downforce, balance and tyre deck at the start of that answer, which means that if we ever need to, we've got the perfect clip to put in for any race review to explain why someone won it pretty much. But uh, yeah, very much Red Bull, the, the class of the field. And that thing about the tyre deck advantage, that was very clear in FP3 when Red Bull burned up that set of C1s. You only have two sets of C1s. They were one of two teams along with Williams that only went in with one set of C1s, which showed how confident they were in that C3 tyre. And Scott, no surprise from testing what we saw last year that Red Bull is on top. So I guess pretty much it's about as comfortable as we expected, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Um, Like I said at the start, there was a little bit of an ebb and flow through practice where it wasn't entirely clear exactly how it would play out 
and whether the Red Bull had been knocked out of the sweet spot that it seemed to be in in testing. There were some factors. The track was certainly at the start of this Grand Prix weekend on the Friday. The track wasn't as grippy as it had been in in testing. A little bit of um, a little bit of rain, some 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 sand that had been 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 blown in as well. I think was an impact at the start of the event certainly, and it did look like the Aston Martin had a kinder, wider working range that just meant it was still responding quite well, whereas Red Bull needed to do a bit of work to get Max Verstappen and even Checo Perez as happy as they needed to be in the car. But that was only trending one way as the weekend continued. It was only getting stronger. And as that picture became clearer, I think it was fairly obvious that Max Verstappen was going into the race a step ahead of everybody else. And you had some people... Ferrari, for example, and Mercedes sort of talking a little bit in vain, but with with a vague hope of, oh, well, maybe maybe we can go after them. Let's see how we go. And then as it turned out, the race did play out exactly as it looked like it would after testing, let alone at the start of this weekend, with the Red Bull just, just being too quick and too good. Sergio Perez really underscored that supremacy. A very good start to the season for him, actually, wasn't it, Mark? 0.138 off in qualifying second place he had a little bit of work to do to deal with Leclerc but that's big tick for Perez to start the season again yeah it is and I think it's probably quite interesting that this is a circuit where in qualifying you have to set the car up with a certain amount of understeer to protect the rear tyres and we know he's, he's quite happy with that sort of balance so it'll be interesting to see if he can maintain that sort of small gap to max as we go to more conventional tracks with more conventional balance but yeah he was um he was I mean, he's looked very purposeful this whole you know, through, through the whole test and and in, into the practices. He, he's, he looked really like a, you know a man on a mission. Really, um, he didn't get a great start on his used tyres compared to Leclerc on the fresh tyres, so that put him a place down. Um, so that yeah, he, he, he just had to be patient, and as you alluded to there with the tyre choice, he was able to run longer on the first set of softs and then get on to a second set of softs while uh, Leclerc was obliged to take the hards and that gave him such a, a big grip advantage. It was relatively easy to to do a conventional pass on track. And from there, he just cruised away from the Ferrari, really. And then the, that, that was the competitive order set, you know, in terms of uh, putting Red Bull first and second. Yeah, there's just nothing else really to say about Red Bull, isn't it? Fastest car, one, two, perfect start. The only thing I would say is um, picking up on something I think George Russell said after the race where he had, he pondered whether or not Red Bull will win every race this season, which I feel is the question that gets asked every time a team starts a season with a dominant result. And I feel <laughs> this could come back and bite me and us in the backside, but I feel fairly confident declaring here and now that Red Bull will not win every single Grand Prix in 2023. No, I mean, it's not completely impossible, but I don't think that's going to happen. Of course, McLaren came very close in 1988. But of course, they wanted to do the final, uh, the season after in 1989. And Ron Dennis was quite keen on that clean sweep after just about uh, doing it the year before. And then instantly they didn't win the Brazilian Grand Prix because of Nigel Mansell's famous win for Ferrari. So uh, best laid plans and all that. But yes, What's certainly clear is Red Bull are going to win a lot, certainly in this early stage of the season. And we can only say hats off to them for what they've done. But Scott, Fernando Alonso and Aston Martin made it interesting. They've been the big talking point in the past few weeks. He made good on that promise, didn't he, Alonso, with that podium finish? But it really was hard work. Yeah, um, he... I feel it was uh, it, it was always going to be a little bit less straightforward than perhaps it looked like it could be at certain stages after testing and then earlier in the weekend when he was setting the pace in practice because the one lap pace wasn't stunning in qualifying. Just as everyone else turned everything up, the Red Bull moved away, the Ferrari came back into the picture and then moved just out of reach. Alonso was able to stay ahead of the bo- both Mercedes, which was good. But it, it meant obviously starting on the, on the third row. Then there was a, another little setback on the opening lap when he got um, assaulted at the right rear by his teammate Lance Stroll. Um, just as a quick aside, I don't know about... Oh, I will ask you two this as a simple question. Did you think that was going to be the end of, if not one, but potentially two Aston Martin races in one 
in like the space of 15 seconds. Really could have been, couldn't it? Yeah, it did. It really did look like that, didn't it, for a, a split second or two. Um, th- th- that that car must be pretty tough. It, it took three hits between the two cars. It, it had three points of contact, didn't it? Um, th- that one with the two with each other, and then um, Alonso with Russell, wasn't it? And uh, it was undamaged in all of them. So uh, yeah, it's strong as well as quick. Maybe it's an Alonso thing because obviously he had a pretty robust Alpine last year as well. Maybe whoever's building his car <laughs> just thinks this guy's going to do something mad at some point, or something mad's going to happen to him. <laughs> so let's just make sure it's extra robust. But that obviously just made life a bit more complicated for for Alonso. And those first few laps, I don't. I, I have, haven't really seen a, a concrete answer to this, whether there was a, a little bit of a an impact on the car that it took a few laps for him to work out how to drive around or if he just had his confidence shaken, was feeling something that wasn't there. There was a bit of a ghost in the machine or something like that. But the first few laps of the race, Alonso's pace didn't look stunning. But once he got into a good rhythm, it started to come to him again and... I was fairly confident halfway through the first stint that he was going to be probably beating both Mercedes and potentially emerge as a threat to Carlos Sainz, whose pace really wasn't that impressive compared to teammate Charles Leclerc in the opening stint. Obviously, as we'll come to, the deja vu sensation for Ferrari and Leclerc opened the door to an Alonso podium in the end. He, uh, He wouldn't have been in the top three without that engine failure. But it was, it it was the race I feel we expected to pan out for Alonso in that we knew that their race pace was stronger than their one lap pace. Everyone was wary, you know, the Ferraris, the Mercs, even the Red Bulls knew that the Aston would be a much stronger Sunday package. So that gradual ascension into where that car really is, which I think is the second fastest race car, I it, it there, just, there was just an air of inevitability about it once that first stint sort of settled in. Yeah, and I think we have to make the point that although it would be unlikely Alonso was going to catch Leclerc, um, Leclerc had had a clean race. And I think had had Alonso not ended up behind the, the Mercs on, on the first lap and he'd had a clean race, um, I think he he'd absolutely would have been with Leclerc and would probably have been able to get past it just on on, on tyre dig. So... Yeah, I think um, the, the 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 competitive order among those four cars was was pretty clear on this track on this weekend. And um, while I've no doubt that the Red Bull will maintain its position at the head of that for you know over, over different circuits, I, I think there might be a bit of variability behind it. And and although it's a, it's a great opening for the the, the Aston Alonso partnership. I think we do need to sound just a little note of caution, um, and that it, it it may it may have been exaggerated by the, as I talked about before, the, the, the how much the Bahrain track um, rewards a, a car that can look after its rear tire as well. And I mean you, that that's always a good thing, but it's um, it, it particularly valuable at this track. Yeah, I think Jeddah could be a little bit harder for that package in general. I don't think it's going to suddenly become terrible or anything. But I think we do have to take our hats off to Aston Martin and what they've been able to do to take this scale of leap. It's mightily, mightily impressive. Yes, they've spent a lot. They've expanded a lot. But to have a car that's working so well and just seems to do what Alonso wants it to do is is very impressive. Well, they've basically, um, they've, they've done a better job of creating a better aerodynamic platform than... Mercedes, the works team, using the same wind tunnel and the same, certainly at the rear of the car, mechanical platform as well. So that, I think, puts it into perspective. The team that has won that won eight constructors titles from 2014 to 2021 inclusive, Aston Martin, little team Silverstone, it, 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 I think it still just about qualifies as an underdog for now because it's in that growth phase. It's still in the factory that it doesn't really fit into anymore. And they've beaten the works team. They've done a better job with the same resources as the works team. Uh, same resources is a bit of a broad brushstroke there, but you know what I mean? I, I think they've humbled some of the biggest teams in Formula One. Uh, they, it is an ambitious project, hugely ambitious. And Alonso talks about them being the only team that are willing to do whatever it takes to win. So... This isn't a team in the same bracket as Williams or Haas, but 
let's we shouldn't kid ourselves into thinking it's in the same bracket as Mercedes or Ferrari either. It wants to get there, but it isn't there now. It should be aiming to try and beat McLaren and Alpine, but it's absolutely thrashed McLaren and Alpine at the start of this season. And to have produced a faster and or more reliable package than both Mercedes and Ferrari, be second only to Red Bull, I think is a, is a genuinely astonishing achievement to have done that in one winter. And also, we have to remember, it's not just Alonso did well. Lance Stroll finished sixth in this race. I have to say, Mark, I thought this was a, a weekend of admirable grit and determination from Stroll. Yes, he was half a second off Alonso in qualifying, about 16-odd seconds behind him in the race. But considering he had no pre-season testing, he had the wrist injuries, <laughs> he'd had surgery a few days before, really, really remarkable effort from him, I think, to, to get such a good result. Yeah, the car's good, but it shows he's got a bit of fight in him. Yeah, absolutely. It was it was really, really gritty. And um, yeah, not you're not driven, you know, the, the, a single lap of that car before the weekend. And even without a wrist injury in those circumstances to qualify within half a second of Fernando Alonso on the same car, but carrying a wrist injury, which did compromise his performance. We saw, you know, the in-car and how he couldn't, he was having to adapt the way he was doing the steering on the on the, on the the slow speed corners. Um, yeah, to, to just to do that, it was was really terrific. And yeah, he made that slight lapse of judgment, which could have gone very badly wrong on the first lap, but didn't. And then he just, he, you know, he lost a couple of places there and um, he got them back and was closing down on Hamilton towards the end. And yeah, I think um, just all round wonderful performance from him, really. Uh, probably his most convincing performance of his Formula One career to date. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. Maybe not most convincing isn't the word I could do, but in a way, most impressive should we say, because he has to be judged completely separately to everyone else. So he convinced me with his attitude and approach and that determination to make it work. And considering he was in reduced form, the pace he showed was was pretty good. So I think I think whatever words we choose, we both agree. It was a strong weekend. Yeah, I think impressive is a good word to use because it, it, it does leave a very strong impression. That That's the thing from start to finish. And I was a little bit unconvinced at the start of the the weekend. I, th- I thought he settled in really nicely on Friday in terms of his his pace. But I and remember on Friday he spent pretty much the first half hour of FP one in the garage with an ignition problem. Yeah, and then by the end of Friday you could see that you know he'd been protecting his wrists, but but then he was in quite a lot of discomfort, and it was a concern seeing him lift himself out of his car with you know all of his weight on his forearms basically and then being helped out by the team and I think that ended up being a little bit sort of like as a bit of a precaution and I'm sure he was very sore with the first day of driving but I believe him when he says every day feels better and I it does feel like the kind of injury that actually when you get behind the wheel as long as you don't do anything to horrifically aggravate it it does feel like the sort of thing that you kind of just need to get a little bit of in-car fitness to, to go through it you know work work the hands get comfortable with it he said after qualifying, he was learning sort of what his body could actually take, what the hands could take. But for someone who, you know, a fortnight before has had an accident, you know, he broke his big toe in the accident as well, a little extra injury that he revealed during the course of the weekend. He said he couldn't, the immediate aftermath of, of the shunt, he he couldn't move his hands, he couldn't walk. He was in all sorts of bother and said if he'd been given a 1% chance of making it to, to Bahrain, he'd have taken it. So to come from all of that and not just get through the weekend, but actually, I think, thrive through the weekend and get stronger through the weekend. That uh, There were maybe like a couple of mistakes crept in in the second half of the Grand Prix, but there was no obvious sign of this being, you know, a really fatiguing injury, really fatiguing race. Just, I go back to the word you used, I... I Cannot remember a time Stroll left such a strong impression in, in, in such a good way. Yeah, I'd, I'd still quite like to know what was going through his mind when he realised he was going to have that moment with Alonso. The first I've day. got a pretty good idea and I'm pretty sure it was an expletive. <laughs> you have the t- chance to think, oh, I'm going to hit my teammate. It's going to hurt my hands, <laughs> the perfect storm. But yeah, he got away with it. And yeah, well done, Lance Stroll. I mean, I've had times when I've questioned him, but... Absolutely, 100%. He's done a great job this weekend. Well done to him. Let's get on to Ferrari now, 
mark. Obviously, not a great result for them in the end. Charles Leclerc retired, Carlos Sainz in fourth place. I was in Fred Vasseur's post-race press conference and he was accentuating the positives, able to fight Red Bull on qualifying pace, he said, and Leclerc managed to split the Red Bulls early on. But how worried do you think they should be, especially with that engine failure that put Leclerc out? I think the engine failure in particular should be very concerning. You know, they've been very confident all through the winter that there's been nothing on the dyno to suggest that they haven't fixed it. And come to the first race and uh, it, it fails. So, yeah, that, that, that's the number one concern. The other slight concern is the, 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 the pace, the race pace. Qualifying pace was quite good. But again, we, we're talking about a funny circuit. And Ferrari have made a big thing of saying that because of the performance pattern last year when they were racing the Red Bull, which was generally a faster car on the straight and the Ferrari had more downforce through the corners, they've rebalanced it a little bit and actually surrendered some downforce in the interest of straight line speed to make it more raceable. And that's got a certain logic to it. But you come to Bahrain uh, where, you know, it's, it's all about controlling rear tire take. That's not a sort of car that you would expect to fare very well in in the race here and something that uh, doesn't have as much downforce as before um it, you know it, it's not that surprising it didn't show as well and there was there was a sense of deja vu about um leclerc's retirement because he famously re- retired from the lead here in 2019 but there's also from carlos Sainz, whose performance was very similar to here last year where he's just struggling to get on with the car in the same way that Leclerc was, uh, it, it, as well as Leclerc was. And he just fell away quite quickly and, and used up the rubber even faster. So, yeah, the, the, there's a few issues for them to to go out there, but I wouldn't say the season's um, a, a write-off or anything like that. It, 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 uh, and I, I, would be, um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it was a very strong contender at, at Jeddah. So I think we need a, a bit more of a sample, really, to get a, a proper read on where Ferrari's at. Um, and I wouldn't put it in the same category as, as of trouble as, uh, say, Mercedes. Yeah, just to stress the tyre difference, obviously, Leclerc ended up falling away a bit because he had to use the hard more than the Red Bulls had to. And nobody used the medium. Well, I think Lando Norris did, but he had to get through quite a lot of sets of tyres given he was in and out of the pits throughout the race for air top-ups. But we spoke to Charles Leclerc briefly after the race, didn't we, Scott? And he he wasn't doing a very good job of accentuating the positive, was he? No. um, He had the air of someone who had um, had a pretty devastating day. Obviously, it was demoralising when... Worst fears are realised in the opening stint and Verstappen's just driving away. Leclerc said he was a second off the pace and just so much work that Ferrari needs to do on the performance side. And this is what wasn't the case last year. So when he had his early engine failures last year, for example, or go back even further, Mark's example, when he should have won the race here in 2019... You can always, it's always a nice little get out of jail free card, especially if it's, you know, the first retirement you suffer of the season or whatever. You can point to the performance and and, and, and it's a, just a, it just takes a bit of the bitterness out of the mouth because you can be looking forward to getting back in the car, fighting again. But when you've, when you've worked that hard, you're going to come away from a podium, but it's a really big defeat of a podium. And you don't even get that consolation of finishing in the top three. You know that you've just lost an absolute ton of points and your cars load slower. As he, I think, to paraphrase what he said, there are, how can you look for positives on a day like that? Yeah, and he certainly wasn't trying too hard to, and I can't blame him at all. And of course, Mark Sainz wasn't really at Leclerc's level this weekend. What did you make of his performance? It was a rather subdued one, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, and it um, it's it's like the last two seasons. He's, he's you know started off not adapting to the new car as well as Leclerc, and I'm sure he'll get there. But it, it, it does seem to be something of a pattern for him, and that uh, he's he's definitely not as at home in this car at the beginning of this year as he was at the end of last year and in last year's car. Yeah, it's strange because he said he was putting a lot of effort in in testing to making sure he didn't get into that same position. He was quite optimistic about that. But yeah, 
just one of those ones where at least he's come away with a, a few points and a reasonable result and and a good battle with Fernando Alonso as well, although they got a bit close at one stage, it's it's fair to say, but that certainly enlivened the later stages of the race. But yeah, not many silver linings for Ferrari, but as you said, Mark, I think we need to see a greater sample set of of track configurations before we're completely sure where they are. Plus, of course, they've got some upgrades coming in the not too distant future. Let's move on to Mercedes now, Scott. Fifth and seventh with Lewis Hamilton and George Russell behind Fernando Alonso and split by Stroll. How chastening was this weekend for Mercedes? And do you think it has any chance of turning things around? It was a pretty galling weekend, I think, and uh, an eye-opening one as well. Uh, they, like I was saying earlier with when I was talking about Aston Martin, They've been humbled by a team that has a, a, a good chunk of the Mercedes in the back of the car around the power unit, gearbox, rear suspension, etc. So, and and the aero's done in the same wind tunnel. So there's nothing wrong with the, the, the raw materials and tools there. Mercedes haven't done a very good job with it. Their concept is either massively, massively underdeveloped in some way or hugely flawed so that is and, and that was basically admitted to over the course of this weekend but it, it would be remiss to focus too much on Aston Martin because it, I think to quote Toto Wolf after the race Aston Ferrari whoever is a sideshow their judgment is against Red Bull the benchmark from last season the gap that they were meant to decrease close in on and it's bigger they're in all sorts of trouble and you heard you you were there listening to Toto speak on Saturday and Sunday and he wasn't mincing his words after qualifying was he he I it, honestly after qualifying it came across as a little bit of an overreaction from the you know the a sample set of a still incomplete first race weekend of the season but Wolf was pretty blunt wasn't he yeah I think they already had a pretty good idea of where they were and they were just waiting for the weekend to play out partially so that they could say conclusively. So what's pretty clear is they've stuck with a very similar car concept to last year, the porpoising and the bouncing, that's gone, no problem at all there. But here we're just talking about sheer performance potential. You said they've hit their targets, but their targets haven't been perhaps ambitious enough and that's perhaps because they're developing a concept that doesn't have the same high ceiling that, that Red Bull does and he's talked about looking at different pathways so hinted looking at different concepts etc and needing to explore different paths he he said he wanted to see some changes in perspective on the technical side and that perhaps they've been sort of laser focused on this this approach this concept and they need to be open to other directions but as he said the numbers don't say they should go in a different direction so that's the big question they've tried other Concepts. I keep saying concepts because that can mean all sorts of things. But you're sort of talking underfloor, not just side pods, but underfloor side pods. The way it all interacts, the way you work all those airflows. And then basically, they've tried those geometries in CFD and wind tunnel and, and haven't found gains. But That really worries me. Sorry to interrupt, but it, it, there's obviously a couple of different ways that can be interpreted. But I'm really worried it says something about how Mercedes interrogates its data or or forms these opinions because so, something's not right there. Either the targets are too low, so they look at it and say, ah, oh, well, if we go down this route, it's not as good as what we've got now. So that's so we won't do it. But what they've got now is nowhere near good enough. But th what what's the alternative? That they, they're just plugging things in the wrong way, reading them the wrong way, and... Or, or, or is their version of we've tried other concepts actually a flawed understanding of what those concepts are? Therefore, they're not testing the right concepts. And if they did, would they suddenly see bigger numbers? It's really worrying that they can say one day at, at that this Grand Prix, we've looked at this other stuff and this ours is the way to go. And then the next day get battered in qualifying and the day after that get battered in the race. Well, I think probably we're in the territory here of you need to take one step backwards to go two or three or four steps forward. They have hit the targets, so that means that they've based those targets on what they think is possible. They've hit them, and that just suggests to me that the approach they're taking doesn't have that ultimate performance potential. But how big a shift they need to make, and we should stress, 
There's an Imola upgrade planned. They have hinted at changes of, say, side pod geometry, but that Imola upgrade isn't going to fix it. Toto Wolf said very clearly that his criticisms of this car were not just the one that was on track, but the one that's in the pipeline at Brackley right now. I very specifically asked him that question, and he said that. So, um, yeah, a lot of work to be done there. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna work through a few questions from members of the Race Members Club at this point, because we've got several on Mercedes, and we'll throw the first one to Mark to bring him in on this. But obviously there's loads of interest in this. And the first one is from Jay Gannon, who says, what are Mercedes going to do? Lewis is saying they cannot go to a plan B, but Mike Elliott is talking about a revision. It breaks my heart to see them so lost. So what are Mercedes going to do then, Mark? They're limited in what they can do because of the cost cap. But um, yet within that, are they going to be radically looking at re-looking at all the assumptions that they've made and trying to work out how to do it, whether that, whether an answer can come in time to rescue this season um, or whether it's a longer-term thing, who knows. But um, in the old days, it would have been probably a case of this absolutely doesn't work, let's get a new car ready for half, you know, halfway through the season. And I don't think that's really feasible under the cost cap rig. So... Yeah, I, I, I'd say they're um, yeah they're in they're, they're not they're not going to have a, an easy time. And the next question, Scott, is from Christopher Partridge, who asks, "How soon could Mercedes bring an updated concept forward and get it up to a winning pace? And will it be enough soon enough to mount a serious title challenge?" Um, well, if if they're this in the dark and having to review things starting this week, we're we're months away from them being able to do something. I certainly haven't had the impression that, for example, what we know they were working on for the start of the European season at Imola, big update package there, that follows this path, doesn't it? That That's not going to be a, a massive conceptual change. Yeah, that might be two or three tenths even, but it's not going to close on Red Bull even if Red Bull stands still. And the key question they're asking is, yeah, we can get some more out of this concept, but what's its ceiling? And that's that's the thing they're trying to answer. So, yeah, in terms of when they can do it, well, it depends when they know what they need to do. I guess that's the point to make. But, and what they need to do. Well, exactly. But if you don't have in the wind tunnel right now the right direction, then you're quite some way off being able to do that. Just just to just to throw in a, a little comparison, I know we haven't talked about them yet and we probably will. Um, it's a slightly different situation to McLaren, for example, another team that started the season on the back foot, not where it wants to be key difference between them is that McLaren's absolutely convinced they have found a much better development direction which they switched to in the late months of last year committed to a very basic version of the original direction effectively for the launch 2023 car which is what they've got now and they will have this change of direction car from Baku with some updates between now and then but Baku being when this I think what will be quite a significant change to the car arrives. So they are already along that process. They are months along that process and they will get that car in Baku and they will hope that that turns around their, their season. If I apply that McLaren timeline or what I think is the McLaren timeline, that's five months from the point of that change to getting it at the track at the level that they want it. If that that's a write-off for Mercedes season if it's anything like like as long. It's very difficult to see them emerging as a title challenger this year. Not impossible. I suspect they will have some ideas of the direction they need to change into. They've been doing work back at the factory. It's not just that they've got to this weekend and suddenly realised, but yeah, they need to make some pretty big decisions and the chances of it being a title contender this year are you're in the low single digit percent possibility. I'm I'm pretty stunned by this to be honest because there was all the talk last year about how much they were learning and how much they'd improve their tools and the fact that they'd there were reasons that they didn't make massive steps in, in, in improvement because there were elements of performance that they weren't prioritizing because they were distracted by the bouncing in the first part of the year and therefore there was going to be lots of stuff that they could do over the winter to to address things. And I bought into that. I think a lot of people bought into that. And I think it's fair to say that as an organisation, Mercedes should be a much bigger threat now than it was 12 months ago because it has learned an awful lot. It should have, in theory, enhanced its understanding of 
the aerodynamic demands of this rule cycle. And yet here we are having the conversation that we're having. I I am I'm just very, very surprised that it seems to have, seems to have dropped the ball in this way. Just goes to show you don't know what you don't know. And I think some unknown limitation is there. They need to find exactly what it is that's sending them in the wrong direction. So it's not just choose your direction, it's understand what it is in the way you're doing things, that underlying science you're getting wrong. The last question on the Mercedes, we'll throw at you, Mark, is from Urban from Slovenia, who says, is it possible for Mercedes to completely change its side pod concept during the year so quickly that it can compete for a championship? Well, I've certainly almost ruled out competing for a championship, but it'd be possible for it to change that side pod. It's a question of, is the side pod the thing to change? Exactly. I think they need to know um, what, what is driving the lack of performance. And um, just just because the side pod's different, that doesn't mean it's there for the side pod. You know, they're, uh, it's much more likely to be found in the, the, the interplay between the underfloor and the side pods and the, the, the rear end of the car. So it's, it's clearly aerodynamic. Um, mechanically, it's the same as the Aston Martin at the, fr- at the back. Um, so yeah, it's, it's to do with the airflow coming through the, over the front wing, through the front suspension, down the side pods and under the floor. And that's, <laughs> that's a huge area. And, um, it's, it's not just, let's change the side pods. Um, even changing the side pods can quite often involve a fundamental re-engineering because you've got to possibly, um, need to move radiators and mounting points and things like that so yeah I don't, I don't think it's as simple as just let's change the side pods to something more conventional um wouldn't surprise me to see different side pods on the car but it would surprise me immensely if that turned out to be a light switch solution yeah well it's all about the direction that he's taken to stress it's not last year's problem it's not porpoising and bouncing it's not some fundamental phenomenon like that it's just lack of performance lack of downforce and to to call back to what you were saying earlier about why red bull's so good it hasn't got the downforce it hasn't got the balance it hasn't got the tire deck uh it needs so yeah a, a big uh, a big amount of head scratching going on back at brackley but we know how powerful that team is. We can't rule them out. And perhaps this will be the thing that will make them understand where the weakness is and tackle it. But then again, we said that last season. So some hard work ahead there. Scott, Alfa Romeo, decent weekend. Valtteri Bottas, eighth. As we thought, the car's not stunningly fast, but it's brisk enough. And Bottas made good on his vow to do better on first laps too. Yeah, he did a really good job. He got a good launch and then made a smart decision, moved to the inside down into to turn one was fairly committed on the brakes, nice and sensible through the outside of, of turn two, just through that whole sequence, just picked off a few positions, got himself into the points and never looked like relinquishing it. I think lost count of the number of times we said this during testing, but it, it looked like a car with no vices. It looked like just a really usable car, really solid, probably at the upper end of that second midfield group, which is where it ended up being. And just because of a, a really sensible, tidy weekend from Bottas and the team. They've managed to outperform one or two cars that ended up being slightly quicker. Certainly the Alpine was a faster car this weekend. But it, it's Bottas who has landed the biggest points of, of, of that lower midfield group. I say lower midfield just purely because I don't mean in that sort of top four or five bracket. So really, really good weekend for 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 him nicely understated he he never looked stunning at any point this weekend in fact i thought that joe guan Yu was piecing together a better weekend up until joe underperformed slightly in qualifying but bottas just proving the value of his almost sort of understated experience and and, and calmness it was a bit reminiscent of the job he did a year ago just obviously not quite as um, spectacular yeah, and well executed by Alfa Romeo as well. They responded to others stopping early on, so they made sure they covered that to ensure he held on to those early gains and just a well executed race. He was the first car that didn't make those stops under the VSC, so he had Gasly charging in them at the end, but he kept him at arm's length. So well executed. And Joe, <laughs> he was a bit unfortunate because he had a whole heap of wheel spin at the start. The initial launch wasn't great, and then loads of wheel spin, so that kind of ruined his race. But they were sharp enough to get him in right at the end to fresh, uh, put some fresh tyres on and get that fastest lap, which for them was all about taking it off Alpine. So they 
see that not quite as a point scored for themselves, but they're denying a direct competitor because, of course, one point for fastest lap, but you have to finish in the top 10 to get it. I can imagine, I might be wrong here, but I feel like that falls into a very, 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 very small bracket of things that you like about the fastest lap bonus point. Yeah, I do. I do uh, quite appreciate that because it's actually being a bit innovative. I mean, it's still very easy for him to do it. He got fastest lap by about a second, as you'd expect. But you, know, you say that, but uh, as I understand it, didn't Lando Norris aim for fastest lap late on, didn't he? And, and just wasn't quick enough to get it. Yeah, he was driving McLaren. That's the problem he had there. <laughs> he, he was ahead of the Alphas. <laughs> that's, in, that's deeply uncharitable. He was ahead of the Alphas in qualifying, but I think that was another Lando Norris qualifying special, to be quite honest. So, yeah, not, not the ideal car. Let's talk a bit about Alpine. We mentioned Gasly there. Mark obviously picked up a couple of points for ninth from the back of the grid. As expected, decent midfield pace, nothing stunning, and a lot of comedy for Esteban Ocon's car with his many penalties. Yeah, yeah it was um, a bit Keystone Cops there for Ocon, but um, Gasly drove a terrific race from the back of the grid. And, you know, you had these time disallowed from Q1 and then you know you got caught in traffic on his, his other run so yeah solidly at the back and uh, came through for, uh, did a really nice race uh, finished ninth got got by Albon at the, near the end and was you know putting a bit of pressure on Bottas as you say and you know ultimately finished what three seconds away from the the back of George Russell and I do think the Alpine and the Mercedes are roughly on the same sort of pace. It's just I think the uh, the Mercedes has been operated a little bit better this weekend. But um, yeah, I think that that's about where it is. It's it's what used to be the head of the the midfield, but that midfield and the the top four teams have all become a little bit merged because because of Mercedes' drop off in performance. So. Yeah, um, I think they're about where they would expect to be on, on pace. They could have had a, a better weekend operationally. Yeah, and there were a few question marks about whether they'd taken exactly the right approach in testing as well because they were quite confident. They hadn't really shown any element of their hands. But then you had Gasly in qualifying say, well, we hadn't really pushed the car to these extremes before and it slightly surprised me. And then you have a few of these aspects not doing the proper full race simulations in testing meant it was a bit un- into the unknown in the race. So perhaps they're catching up a little bit from that. But fundamentally, their car is at about the right sort of pace. So I'm sure they'll get on top of all of that. Yeah. The one thing I wanted to just add very quickly on on, on Ocon is um, his race actually, this is this is a very me interjection, I apologise, but it actually reminds me of Andre Lotterer's Formula E debut back in 2017. And the reason it reminds me of that is because that weekend I was covering Formula E at the time stands out, has always stood out in my memory as just the most ridiculous penalty field event that I've ever seen a driver do. But I think Ocon, by cramming three of these penalties, two self-inflicted into one race, has, has taken that crown. Just, I'm sure probably everybody listening to this isn't aware of this um a lot lotterer's debut ended up with uh he got a 22 second drive through substitute penalty for using the escape road at one of the chicanes in in the hong kong track without coming to a complete stop before re-entering the circuit so it was a really silly penalty to pick up but then the best part is he then um, got disqualified afterwards anyway for leaving the car in a in a, in a certain status in, in park Ferme, and i think he then got managed to then get another penalty or disqualification in the second of that weekend's doubleheader the next day. So it was an app, it was a proper absolute nightmare one, but it was split across multiple things, whereas Ocon managed to do all three things in one race. And I, I've just, I've never seen anything like that. It was, it was pure slapstick. Yeah, it wasn't great for him. Out of position at the start, only very marginally. A bit of front wing damage he picked up as well. And then when that front wing was being changed, he already had that five second penalty and they started working on the car it was about 0.4 of a second before he'd served that five for second penalty. And then a bit premature on the speed limiter button coming out of the pits. So picked up a, another penalty before eventually retiring just in disappointment at everything I think that had, had happened. So yeah, a tough one for Ocon, but he was brisk in qualifying, got into Q3. So I'm sure we're going to see plenty of good performances from him this season. 
Well, as always, we're going to round out our race review podcast with some quick fire questions from the race members club. First up for you, Scott from Christopher Parrott. Has Fernando Alonso already seen enough to take up the option for a third year on his contract? There was the second part to that question, which I'm going to throw in in a moment. So um, I, I think this is a very, very good start to Alonso's Aston Martin career. However, Alonso is the master of starting these new team relationships in a brilliant way. So I am just a bit cautious. I don't I, I don't think it's wise for anybody to try and predict where Alonso's relationship with a team will be three years down the line. But this is where I thought the Alonso Aston Martin train might end up towards the end of his time with the team. So for it to be starting this way is incredibly encouraging. And I think Alonso will be desperate to see this out for as long as he can. So yeah, no reason at this stage why he wouldn't want to be here as long as possible. Ahead of schedule then. The second part of that question was, do we believe Lando Norris when he says he believes in McLaren? Yes, because at the moment, there is some sound logic to 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 what they're saying and what they're expecting and what they still want to achieve this season. I suspect it will be a different th- matter if the new car arrives and after a few races with that newer car from Baku there isn't a big step, then I think we will hear a, a noticeable shift in tone from Lando. Yeah, that could make things very, very interesting. Just got to be patient for these next few races. But he did think he could have gone into the points without problem. Obviously, he had difficulties from very early on that hobbled the car, the captain to top up the air supply for the pneumatic. So yeah, it's just one of those bad races for McLaren across the board. And of course, Piastri DNF'd, but I think Piastri did a pretty good job actually this weekend. So better start than perhaps the results suggest for Piastri. Mark, next question from Danny Danielski who says, does Aston Martin have a chance of maintaining this performance throughout the season? And what's Alonso doing differently to move the goalposts for longevity in the sport? Very much a question of two different halves there. Um, yes, I think Aston Martin is is uh, going to be, you know, a factor throughout the season. It's already, you know, Got a better car than Mercedes. It's we'll see. It may be better than a Ferrari. And as Alonso said um, today, you know, that this is a new concept for us. Everybody else is just developing in their existing concepts, but we're we're just finding out new stuff. So there's lots of there's lots of new knowledge to acquire yet, and we're probably going to be making good progress on that. So yeah, I, I so I don't suddenly see them having made such a sensational start. I don't see them suddenly becoming, um, you know back down of the midfield. I, I think they will be a factor for the for the rest of the season. Um, in terms of longevity, I mean, what most drivers that retire do so because they've lost the motivation, they've lost the love of doing it. Um, it's not because, for physical reasons. I mean, it, uh, I think there's a bit of a mis, um, miscomprehension about what it is that... Uh, that makes drive a, a driver quick and and, and it, it, it's not necessarily dulled at, at such an early age as 42 uh, it, but you, you rarely see people going that long because they, they rarely stay motivated that long and, and historically you couldn't really realistically have a career that long you know decades ago because um, you were running the averages of, of injury or death so I think it's unusual for someone in reduced circumstances to still retain that passion and that absolute desire to prove that you're absolutely still at the cutting edge. And I think that's where Alonso is remarkable and unusual and probably unprecedented because it's one thing to maintain that level of focus and intensity when you're fighting for championships and championship caliber cars. But to hang around for a whole decade and, and, and still be burning with that desire is, is, is what is so remarkable about Alonso. Um, but I don't physically, I don't think it's anything remarkable that um, somebody can still drive a Formula One car fast at 42 years old. I think um, there's many years left in him yet, even if he wants to. 
Well, he did joke in the press conference about another 10 years or so, so who knows with him. But I think that unfinished business sense that he's got is a quite big motivating factor as well for him. Next question comes from Danny Elliott, who says, top effort by both Williams drivers today. Do you think both drivers can fight for a few points in more races? I'll take that one. And yes, I think they can. It'll be track dependent. The car is better this year. It doesn't have a vast amount of downforce, but it's reasonably well balanced. It was very, very good on the straights today. So Albon was able to keep Gasly, for example, at bay for quite a long time. Then there was the VSC and Gasly got him shortly after that, after they'd all changed tyres. And Logan Sargent performed pretty well as well. So yeah, they've got two good drivers. They've got a car that's handy. Albon felt he could have nipped into Q3 if he hadn't had that front wing damage that wasn't self-inflicted in Q2. So yeah, Williams are they're kind of at the back on pace but they're much much closer at the back and in a position where with someone like Albon doing a really really good job they can get some good qualifying positions and some good results I'm sure they'll score more points this season they did last season but there will be some tough weekends as well Scott Adam Royal Wait on a similar topic says how impressed were you with Logan Sargent's first race yeah I was um I was really impressed with Sargent's entire weekend actually I thought he piece things together really well we got to a good level in qualifying so unlucky not to get into q2 match lando norris to the thousandth the only reason he didn't progress and lando did is because lando set the lap sooner so really good effort there pace looked genuinely decent and then just a totally didn't look out of place at all debut for on on sunday in the race itself he was competitive. He seemed to look after his tyre as well. He raced cleanly in the opening laps. And to finish, what was I think, nine or ten seconds behind Albon at the flag? That's a really good effort. We, we, we know how good a job Albon can do in these kinds of races when he's got the car underneath him. He's a great, great benchmark for Williams to have as a team, but also for Sargent to have as a driver. And I feel like Sargent compared to that benchmark really nicely. When Williams signed him, I thought it was a really interesting kind of wildcard type of pick because he wasn't the finished product in Formula 2, but he was a driver with a really interesting upside. Someone who has shown enough through his junior single-seater career to see that there's a bit about him and that there is clearly some raw really nice raw material to work with there but also a proper hunger desire and ability to improve enough to be a good all-round driver not just someone who's a bit of a rough diamond or anything like that I always felt like he could surprise people this year and I think when we did a sort of prediction slash big questions answered piece on the website before this weekend I said I think that Sargent could impress the the most among the rookies purely because I don't think people have that high expectations for him this year. I like to think that his debut is the sort of first step towards proving anyone who thinks he's in that seat just because he's American and Williams just wants the novelty of American driver is wrong. He's there on merit and he could be a really interesting Grand Prix driver. Next question, Mark. We've touched a bit on this on the subject of Alpine from Thomas Knights, but there's a little bit more we can get into here. Given the optimism Alpine seemed to have coming into the season and their pace at the end of 2022, just how underwhelming was their weekend? Battling with the Williams is not where they would expect to be. It was underwhelming in a way, wasn't it? And it, there are question marks that are raised by it, I guess. Yeah, but it it, it, it was underwhelming because of the way that they, their weekend went and the, the operations Um and if you just look at the underlying pace, where should those two cars be qualifying? There's no question that the Alpine, you know, half half a grid up away from the Williams. But you know, if if you get your operations wrong and you end up with one car in Q1 and the other one in and out of the pits, you'll end up, you know, fighting with cars that are, you know, back into the grid cars normally. Although you know, Alpine did get it out into into Q2. Um, yeah, I, t- I, I I don't think that. Um, Alpine had a disastrous weekend in in terms of the looking forward for the rest of the season, but I, I think 
um, anyone that was hoping that they're going to break through into the big time this year, I think they, they might be disappointed. Yeah, 100 race plan for them, much vaunted 100 race plan. That started last year. That's to get to the front and be consistent podium finishers. So they've still got a bit of time. Restarted last year, an arbitrary restart of a process that actually started in 2016 as a five-year plan but it's now a 100 race plan that started because they've rebranded the team, which definitely changes absolutely everything. Well, that's the thing. Never get to the end of your plans and people never ask you why you've missed your target. It's a good strategy there. Next question from Joe Andrews, which I'll take, says, Nico Hulkenberg was very strong in qualifying. Why has this gone under the radar? And has this already proved they were right to get rid of Mick Schumacher? Yeah, he was very strong in qualifying, very much on top of the car. I think he got a reasonable amount of credit for it, but obviously in the race, picked up the front wing damage. So it was a, a nothing race for him. He did have a nose change later on to fix that, but there was no chance of converting that into points in the race. There were already some concerns about the race pace of the Haas anyway, even without that. But yeah, I'm not particularly surprised Nico Hulkenberg did that. He's always been a quick racing driver. I think he's still got something to offer in Formula One and proved they were right to get rid of Mick Schumacher. Well... <laughs> Yes, ultimately they got Hulkenberg because he's an experienced, proven F1 driver who can deliver dependably in a way that Mick Schumacher struggled to last year. So certainly what we've seen so far, Hulkenberg's doing what he's there to do. Scott, the final question from Simon Townend to you. Please give me some hope that this season will be competitive and not over by the summer break. That's more a plea than a question. <laughs> it does feel that way, doesn't it? Um, I'd love to reel off a bunch of reasons why I think that there will be a monster title, title battle that will evolve over the next few months. I, I think I have to be realistic and say that there there is a chance that this season goes the way of last year and the title itself does become a bit of a formality over the next few months. But I do have a lot of inherent optimism that race by race at the very least race by race, we can have interesting narratives. And we were spoiled in 2021 with just how mega that season was. But unfortunately, the reality of F1 for a long time now, going back several years, is that the title fight has never really materialized or never gone the distance. And we've been relying on race by race narratives for quite a long time, basically the entirety of the, the V6 hybrid era, with the exception of the 14 and 16 Hamilton Rosberg battles. So unfortunately, that that does look like the reality but don't give up hope Bahrain's very specific circuit the next few circuits are very different profiles they'll ask different things of the cars drivers tires everything so let's look on the bright side like I said like I said at the start of this podcast let's bask in the glow of new season optimism and hope that it's going to turn around from here and if not maybe we'll just be relying on Fernando Alonso for, for some ridiculous heroics and or pantomime antics because we know he's good for both well, if he keeps doing what he's doing, I think that's going to keep everybody entertained. Mark, do you want to throw in a reason for optimism? Um, yeah, I think Ferrari will. Um, there'll be there'll be tracks where Ferrari are contenders. I don't think they're fundamentally um, limited in the way that Mercedes currently are. And uh, yeah, Aston Martin and seeing the continued development of that partnership with with Alonso, I think uh, there's plenty to look forward to there. And I also think that things could pick up in Jeddah in a few weeks. The reason being that we've had a lot of these, haven't we? We've had a season opener where it's a little bit of doom and gloom because it's been a little bit of a dominant performance. People are expecting it to be a walkover and then you get to another circuit and things change completely. Now, I'm not going to say that Red Bull and Verstappen aren't short odds favourites to win the World Championship, but I think there's going to be some twists and turns over this season. So that's my optimistic take on it. Well, thanks as always to Scott and Mark. Head to therace.com and don't forget the hyphen as there's plenty to read there about the Bahrain Grand Prix weekend. Have a listen to our many other podcasts, including Bring Back V10s and our IndyCar podcast too. And if video is your thing, take a look at our YouTube channel. It's one down and 22 to go in 2023. So stay with us for everything you need to know from the world of Formula One. <laughs> 